Well, hey, guys, I recommend the amazing detective series written by my friend and fellow attorney, Dan Flanagan. Set in the 1980s, the Peter O'Keefe series follows the exploits of a troubled Vietnam vet turned private detective. Peter O'Keefe encounters corrupt businessmen, cocaine smugglers, outfit mobsters, tipsters, and hustlers. In the latest installment on Lonesome Roads, the outfit forces O'Keefe to make a devil's bargain to safeguard his loved ones and uncover the truth behind attempts on his life. Check it out now. If you love thrilling mysteries, these are must-read books. I promise you, Dan gets it right. Well, hey, guys, all you wiretappers out there. Another show of Gangland Wire back here in the studio. As you can see, you see my little library over there. A couple of last legal manuals I've got over there. Those black and gold things. I need to get rid of them, too. So today I went back to an old interview where I did with John Bulldog Drummond. Now, you guys in Chicago will remember John Bulldog Drummond. He was a very famous, very well-known, dynamic TV reporter at the time over the 50s, 60s, and 70s. He just kind of cut his teeth on the 1968 uh, Democratic National Convention, actually. I interviewed him years ago, and, and we just went on. I just let him have his head, and he just told about all his different mob stories and his relation to them. And and he's got some good ones. We start off with, let's see, I had to make some notes here. We start off with what he remembers about Jerry Scalise and Art Rachel coming back uh, on the airplane from England after they stole the Marlboro Diamond. And then when they got caught trying to break into Angelo LaPrieta's house, um, then we go to, um, oh, he, do, he does a whole thing on Tony Spilatro and Lefty Rosenthal. But I think I think the best story in here, and it's worth going through the early stories. He talks pretty fast, but I know you guys in Chicago will enjoy listening to Bulldog Drummond's voice again. But he almost got caught up in a mob hit of Billy Dopper, who was a mob enforcer, got killed with his wife. So he's got a really good story on that. He's got several other stories, a, a man named uh, John D. John that he developed as a source who was also talking to the feds that that after the guy got killed shortly after the last time he met with him and the guy was telling him all kinds of good info about the outfit at the time and he was kind of a minor guy but he he knew some stuff and the guy got hit about a week later and, and uh bulldog was told by somebody else that this guy was hit because he was getting too close to bulldog and he was afraid that that Bulldog would expose too many of their secrets on the television, on their, on his news show. Uh, so it's, a, it's a fun, interesting, wild ride through seventies and eighties Chicago outfit from the viewpoint of one of your more famous newsmen, John Bulldog Drummond. What happened that day? I recall when it happened. It was in, in 1980 when these two men actually, uh, Scalise, by the way, had a reputation as a, as a, as a, as an enforcer had, a, and some reputation involved in certain murders. The story broke that two men had gone into this, uh, this jewelry store in, in London called Graff's, which is a very prominent store. They were in the Mayfair section, I think it was in London. I'm not sure what it was, but it was a nice, nice, but I think it was Mayfair's. At any rate, they went in there and, uh, and started to rob the place and obtained what was called the Marlboro Diamond, which, according at the time, supposedly had a retail value in 1980 of $980,000, probably the most largest significant jewel heist that we've ever had. But according to what witnesses said at the time, the two men go in there, brandish these weapons, get the jewelry, put them in a bag, including the Marlboro Diamond, and one of them had a mask, and the mask fell down. It seems <laughs> like these guys were sophisticated. I can't believe what happened. They went out. Uh, they took a car, uh, as you would, I think they took a cab to go back to the, air to the airport and try to get back to Chicago, which they did. But the point was, it was so amateurish. In this point, they had registered the hotel. Apparently, they took a, rented a car initially under their own name, which was left on the scene, and they took a cab. On the way to the airport, they stopped at the... Uh, at one of the post offices in downtown London and mailed a package to New York or somewhere like that. And authorities to this day, and by the way, the Marlboro Diamond has never been recovered. And the authorities believe what happened was that they mailed that diamond and other goodies uh, to friends or cronies in the United States, particularly thought it was in New York. And then they boarded a plane. By that time, Scotland Yard had realized who these individuals were. They had cabled ahead to the FBI in Chicago, and they got off of a plane in Chicago, came into O'Hare, and were arrested immediately. 
and searched, but there was no diamond. And by the way, I remember at the time that made the Walter Cronkite show. We we were aware of what was coming in, and that shot of them coming coming in the plane. So we got that on the air, and it turned out to be quite a quite a story. They were tried in London, and, and they came were extradited back to the Great Britain and did some time there. But the mystery remains. In fact, Scalise himself. It was later, when he got out of prison. Diamond, of course, is still the big story. And as, I, as you indicated, as we before went on the air, that that's a story in itself. But yeah. as, to, to my knowledge, that nothing has ever happened on that. Nothing at all. Apparently, he's not a kid. He would be a man now about 80 years old. And, uh, and the other gentleman, uh, Art the Brain Rachel, would be a, a little couple years younger. Apparently, they wanted action. These men, at, at last report, are still doing federal time. What they did after they got out of the uh, of jail in London, in the States, in Chicago for a while, the next thing we know, they were indicted on two things. Number one, a bank robbery in one of our suburbs, and number two, a break-in at the home of a, a feared uh, mob enforcer at one time, Angelo La Petra, who was deceased, but her, his widow and daughter were living there, and they went and figured that he had money in the house. At any rate, they were arrested again, and here were men in their late 70s being charged because I think they wanted the action. I think they wanted action, and they've been back in a prison time, even despite they were geriatric robbers at that time. So the last I heard, the two men are in jail, and the, the mystery of the Marlboro Diamond has never, never been been solved. And I always thought that the, our friend, Mr. Scalise, who I talked to, I remember at the last trial he was at, in connection, that is, the trial where he was involved in the bank robbery and the break-in, the attempted break-in of the house of this mob figure, former mob figure, that he went number one, write a book, and I think he was figuring on a movie deal, because if you might have seen a movie came out in 2008 about John Dillinger. He was used as a consultant that time. I remember that much. Uh, that was before <laughs> before he got involved in the most recent trouble. But to my knowledge, he has he has no, he can tell what happened to the Marlboro Diamond. We don't know to this day. Was it broken up? I think most uh, jewel experts tell me they would have been too hard to sell a rock like that in one piece. They think it's been broken up. If that's the case, at any rate, the mystery of the Marlboro Diamond is still with us. One of the biggest jewel heists of all time, and so far nobody's talking. So there's a mystery for you right there. The top the position was that they were going to, the, the leadership in the outfit was going to get a cut out of it. They didn't operate independently. No way. There's no way about that at all. I think that's, but anytime scores like that, Mr. Scalise has always been uh, alleged to have been involved in several major armed, armored car robberies in the area, and one in Hammond, Indiana. There was big loot on those, and of course, when that happened down, the, uh, the outfit elders get, of course, a certain cut of that swipe out of the money on that. And that, I'm sure it was the same case with that. And I'm sure also, even though times have changed, they were probably told to keep their mouths shut. But, of course, that's, been, that's 37 years ago. The people who are in command then are no longer around, of course. But still, there's nothing that's happened. And uh, Scalise, by the way, while he was in London, here's a sidebar story. He lived in the suburb, a southwest suburb. And uh, the FBI got from an informant told me there were some bodies buried on his property there. And lo and behold, they did find, they opened up, they started digging, and there was two, two at least two people that were gangland slayers, uh, uh, victims that were found when they uh, tore up that property. But, of course, Scalise never had to shed any light on that either, I might add, needless to say. You say, my gosh, that's, you don't go into a former mob leader's house and break in. A former, another mob leader was imprisoned by the name of Frank Calabrese, and the FBI broke into his house and found out all his jewelry and value that he'd stashed away. So I think apparently Scalise and Rachel said, hey, I bet if that guy had that Calabrese had that kind of dose, La Pietra has the same, so let us go in and get some of that swag, figure it is there. But they never broke in. They were there on the scene, and that's when they got arrested. And then they had bugged the car. They had bugged these guys as well. So they heard the conversations. In fact, a amusing, amusing thing about it before they went in, how they wired this stolen this vehicle they had. But uh, the men, one of the men, there's a third man with him who was a lower echelon guy, and he had to, he had to urinate. And he said, I can't hold it much longer. <laughs> so they decided to go into the home right away. <laughs> but those are some of the sidebar stories with it. But that's a very fascinating story. There's no denying that. Let me tell you right now that my knowledge of the movie being filmed, or maybe it's done in Toronto, Canada, not in Chicago, about Tony Accardo, but the theme is pretty much about the break-in into his house in 1978. And i got to tell you what that was about. What happened was, Accardo uh, was a friend of a jeweler uh, that uh, had a place on the north side. And uh, some hotshot burglars, John, I mean, John Mendel was the name of the ringleader from Lincoln, which is a suburb, who was considered one of the best burglars that the, the outfit had, decided around Christmas time to break into this jewelry store. And uh, got a tremendous haul they pulled out of there. It turned out, however, that the owner of that store was a friend of Accardo. And uh, the man called Accardo and said, look, what's happened? We've had this break-in, blah, blah, blah. They've taken this, they've taken that. And because he was a friend of Accardo, Accardo was, was sympathetic to him. And he got ordered, and it was an outfit break. I mean, they had to pay proceeds. 
uh, to abolish that top of the loot to, to the outfit, they soon found out who they were, and Ricardo ordered those people to return the jewelry to him. In other words, to take them over to his house, the jewelry, the money, the money and everything, to the house that they got, and then he returned it back to the, the, uh, to the jeweler. It turned out that the John Mandela, as I indicated, was the ringleader with four or five other guys, and apparently the young guys started to figure, hey, this isn't right. We do this score. We do the work. A perfect job. And now the old man sitting out in California says, hey, got to turn the stuff back in. That's not right. They broke into his house. He lived in River Forest at that time. He was not there at that time. He was living, he was in California. And broke into his house to, and got the swag back, got the jewelry and everything, got money and all that stuff out of there. And, and apparently, Ricardo, I heard from a, a FBI agent that he had an informant, that, quote, they had never seen the old man, meaning Ricardo, so angry. When he found out that they had broken into his house, he ordered what the story was. He wanted these people apprehended, and not only apprehended and killed, but tortured before they died. Now, right away, you say, how do, you, how do they know for sure who did it? Well, what they, remember during Vietnam, we call it blanket, the B-52s with blanket bombing. In other words, they just drop bombs all over the place, figure collateral damage, you get some, you might, innocent people might be killed, but that's the law of the jungle. We're going to get the right people. So they started, it's all of a sudden, these burglars started end up in trunks of cars, and it was obvious what, uh, that why they were in those trunks, because they felt that they were the ones involved in the, in the break-in. It turned out it was a trial called Family Secrets in 2007 and 8 that, uh, the story came out that a man named Frank Calabrese had orchestrated a lot of those murders uh, to uh, placate Mr. Ricardo. So those were solved uh, as far as the jury was concerned. And several people, including uh, Calabrese, were convicted and uh, went to jail. But that was unprecedented. A break-in in Tony Ricardo's house was unbelievable. That's major business. As I indicate, there is a movie. Had, by the way, Robert De Niro had the lead role originally. And apparently, for some reason, he dropped out of it. And the last I heard, Sylvester Stallone was taking the place of Ricardo that's in the movie. The story, I heard, the story I heard was De Niro was paid to do this. Came in, and for some reason, or other, then they had a problem between the producers. and I think a French outfit was shooting the picture in Toronto. Oh. And there was a fallout between the producers, that is, the working people, and the people that bankroll in the French. And so there was a thing, thing was held up, and De Niro said, I'm out of here. And still got uh, quite a few bucks out of it. Wow. And then they hired Stallone to take the part of it. And the last I heard, they had sh this was two or three months ago, that they were shooting it and still in Toronto. And I assume they must be done with the darn thing by now, unless there's no other problems. When the release date is of that, I don't know. I don't know the name of the title, but I do know that the fuss of it is about a card, the, bur the burglary of the Ricardo and the, and the murder of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, the intruders, the burglars. Interesting. Which is quite a yarn. Yeah. Uh, Billy Dauber was a man of, <clears throat> he was a South Suburban resident, but his job was, to keep the chop shops in line. And let me explain what that is. The outfit, the outfit soon began to find out there was more money when you steal a car, not to pedal it in a tax, say, steal a 1975 Cadillac, break it up and chop it up, and there's more money in selling the parts to it. So the result was that these people who were stealing the automobiles would take them over to the uh, to the yards, as they called some of these chop shop yards, some of these auto yards in the south suburbs. There was a lot of them. And then the vehicles would be chopped up, and then re the parts would be sold. Much more lucrative than it was to sell the car in per se. Dauber's line... Uh, Jobber's job for the outfit, they claimed, was to keep those yards in line. And some of those that were not paying their, their, their street tax to the mob, they were trying to get away with that. And his job was to keep them in line. If they didn't do that, he would kill them. So he had the reputation of being one of the biggest hitmen in Chicago history. How many people he killed, I think a newspaper in Indiana claimed it was around 30. I don't believe that's that many, but he did definitely. He was a feared guy. There's no question about it. Dauber was but very feared. Well, it so happened the government, of course, was putting pressure on him. And what happened was they arrested him on a minor drug charge. And what happened was he started cooperating. He started cooperating with Uncle Sam with the strike force, apparently naming names and see who was responsible for this and that. Well, the outfit soon found out about it. And Scalise, by the way, was one of those who found out about it what I was told. What happened was on July 2nd, 1980 at Will County Courthouse, I remember this because I went, I went to the cover of that story today that it was a, I know it was a minor, mere, mere, minor court case, but I said, we need to get more pictures of Billy Dauber. So I went down to the crew and we got Dauber coming out of the building afterwards. I noticed he was very subdued. Usually he's a very angry, hot-tempered guy. It just seemed like uh, he's, he's a different personality. He just went and went by and walked, says, how are you? That boom, walked away. We got ready to put our gear away. 
And when he came back, I, I wanted to, I wanted the crew to follow him to his, to his new home because I heard it was very, he was very protected. He's worried about getting hit. It was, it looked like a castle. It looked like almost a fort. And the supervisor at the station, no, no, you can't do that. I got another story for the crew. You come back with a courier. We got another story for you. So no sooner did I get back to the station. Now this was in Joliet, which is about 45, 35, 45 miles away from the station. I got back into the station and into my office. The phone rang. The guy picked it up. I picked it up and he said, your pal got hit today. Bang and showed them the door down. And then I found out later that the, the Will County Sheriff's Office I contacted, they said Dr. Arbery had been killed along with his wife. And uh, leaving, that they had left. In other words, the authorities later pointed out, it came out during the trial, by the way, the family secret trial, that uh, Calabrese and the other people, the assassins, were sitting outside the courthouse when we took Dauber out there. Dauber got into his car. And they followed him down a road, uh, a county road, county highway, to his home and ambushed him there. They blocked him as two cars. They blocked one of them was a chase car right and blocked him in front. And then they took shotguns and killed both of them. It was a very brutal murder. And by the way, also, everybody, there are several people indicted in that, including Frank Calabrese. His brother was also responsible. They named Scarpelli and a guy named Butch Petroselli were the shooters. And also supposedly named in court our good friend Jerry Scalise. But nothing ever happened. And that Scalise was never charged in that thing. And uh, he never was indicted or anything like that. So that might have been street talk. But Scalise's name surfaced in that murder as well as I'm sure Jerry will remember. And uh, that was an incredible story. Also, the fact is we got the last moments. I think after we made that shot of Dauber, and his, Dauber leaving the courthouse i think he was dead within within 15 minutes of the time he left so i was quite a shock when i in fact i have to admit i went into the newsroom because they had another story for me and they didn't know what to do with this what are you gonna do? i said what are you gonna do with this dauber thing i got video of him. well no maybe we'll make what we call a voiceover mention he was in court today on drug charges well i think he needs a little more room than that i said the guy what about him being hit today is that worth any few more minutes what <laughs> they didn't know that because i just had the call so that, at least i had the last laugh on them but to this day i, I told if the crew would have followed him I, I recommended when i called in i said i can't i'm busy you got me something to do can the crew follow him to i want to see his new house his new fort had they followed him Lord knows what's going to happen. I told the crew, I said, look, if you'd have followed me when I come on scene when the shooting occurred, and you'd have the story of a life, of a lifetime. And, and if you got killed, if the guy saw you and he was witnessing, then you'd be shot. But here's the, it's a no, it's a win-win situation because then your wives would get double indemnity. Either way, you're going to be a winner. They didn't agree with me on that. That would be even a bigger story if they'd got shot. That would be cool. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Well, I hate to say it, but the, the station would love that. The numbers, the numbers that would go through the roof. So bet you it is. Don't kill yourself. But no, but there was one murder that was solved that was cleared. And uh, as I say, a man by the name of Calabrese, Scarpelli, and a man named uh, Butch Petroselli were involved in and Frank Calabrese, who turned states, was the, the brother turned states evidence on him. And he was the one who told a lot about that. So that's one murder that was finally cleared. A lot of homicides and gangland murders for years were never being cleared. And the murder was 1980. So you turn the, turn the pages of time back on that. And that only came out because... Uh, during the family secrets trial, one of the killers decided to cooperate with the authorities and spill the beans, so to speak, and became the key witness. Quite, in fact, Frank Calabrese on and the sta- on the stand at the trial had mentioned my name, how I had made the story. He didn't say I was outside the courthouse, but he said how oh, we broke the thing or something like that. No, no, they knew I was there, all right. That was, well, actually, uh, let's face reality. In, in Chicago, at least, I can't talk to other major uh, areas. As far as the mob, there has never been anybody in Chicago that has uh, been killed by the outfit that was not uh, working with the outfit. The only exception would exception would be back in the 30s, a man by the name of Jake Lingle. Jake Lingle was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. And he was shot in the Illinois Central Railroad Station by some of Capone's guns, uh, gunsels, as they called them. And Colonel McCormick, who at that time was running the Tribune, was enraged that one of his own men, one of his own reporters, had been gunned down by the Capone mob. Oh, really? Well, the next day or two, one of the reporters from the Tribune told Mr. The Colonel, I said, well, Colonel McCormick, I think we better back off on this because it turns out that Lingo was on Capone's payroll. <laughs> and so that murder was uh, actually, could, you couldn't say that he was killed because he was a reporter because he had a financial problem with some of the Capone, a beef with some of the Capone people. And the only person I know that we had a case, believe it or not, here in Chicago, that uh, of a young a woman at the time in 1957, I remember this by the name of Molly Zelko was her name. She worked for a, 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 a county, a newspaper in Will County. That's where uh, Dauber was, by the way. It exposed gambling down there, a weekly paper, and she disappeared in 1957. She's never been seen since, and there's no question about it. She was met with foul play. I don't think there's any argument about that. Be the advice, it's always been a fact, particularly in the Cardo, when the, the syndicate or the outfit in Chicago was very well disciplined. And a carter was smart enough to know that supposing they kill a reporter, uh, whether it was newspaper print, uh, radio, or television, whatever the case might be, it would be counterproductive because there'd be such a, so much heat on them. 
In other words, it'd be a, it'd be a, a coalition of newspaper people and, and electronic people putting pressure on the, the federal authorities, particularly, to solve that murder. And that in a lot of heat, they'd been brought up before grand juries. A case in point was in 1976. I was not out there, but I remember, well, a guy named Don Bowles, that's B-O-L-L-E-S, who was a reporter for the Arizona Registered Republic. He, he was doing some stories exposing mob a- activities in that in Maricopa County. He went to his car one morning, got into the vehicle, turned on the ignition, and he was blown to smithereens. What happened after that, 1976 ball, there was a coalition of, uh, of uh, newspaper reporters, particularly, that came out to Phoenix, Arizona, to put heat on the sheriff's police and the, the, the district attorney's office in Maricopa County. And so that happened. That they, I think eventually they did uh, clear that case. But my point is, it showed the pressure that the media can put on, on, on to help solve crimes. And the only other one I remember was Victor Rizel, was a, a syndicated columnist in New York on labor racketeering. And he had exposed some uh, labor racketeers, Johnny Dio and some of those guys in New York. He's walking down the street in Manhattan. Guy comes up to him and says, this is for you, Vic. Boom. They threw acid into his eyes. He was blinded. Many cases I know of organized crime where the reporters have been the victims. I did a story with a man by the name of John D. John. That name, it does means nothing. Although there's a fight group in uh, Syracuse by that name. But this fellow, John D. John, his father was a gangster called Nick D. John, who was murdered out in San Francisco in the 40s. John D. John was a minor hoodlum. He did trials and burglary and, and some check caddy kiting and a few things like that. And he wrote me a letter. He was getting out of jail in Leavenworth and he wanted to tell stories about the mob out of school. Apparently he got disillusioned. So I warned him. We did this interview, did the piece. And he was still at the MCC at that time. He hadn't been released. The MCC is the Metropolitan Correctional Center. He'd done his time in the Leavenworth prison. He was doing about 90 days in the MCC. He couldn't be released. So I interviewed him there and uh, did the story where he was, he named names. And I obviously, I told him, warned him before. I said, you know, doing this could uh, jeopardize your health and so on. And he said, no, no, I'm going ahead. He wanted to go. He was bullheaded to do this. He wanted, insisted on doing it. He said, I'll go somewhere else. And uh, what happened was he was released and uh, he called me. After he got out of jail, he was living on a, on a hotel, just got out of jail, a hotel on Rush, in the Rush Street area there. And he said, I can't talk to you now. I just got out. We got to meet, but I got to be very careful because I've alienated a lot of people. Two days later than that, he was killed uh, in an alley, pumped with eight bullets in him in the, on the northwest side. And I felt there's no question about it that I felt guilty in the way on this. And I still feel fat about it. I think there's no question that his relationship with me probably caused his demise. In fact, one of the Area 5 detectives said he was too friendly with you. The word got out that he was spilling the beans, talking too much, and they didn't like that. And then, of course, after the incident where he was slain, in that case, I couldn't know. There has never been, that case never got off the ground. In other words, he was just a, I saw, he was not a big shot. And I don't think the Area 5 or the police, I don't think there was a great deal of effort to finally clear who it was, because he was a hoodlum in those days. They had one less hoodlum to worry about. In fact, I did interview, uh, not on camera, a guy by the name of Popeye was his name, and he was named, his name had surfaced that he was one of the ones who killed this John D. John, but he denied it to me on camera, which is rather, rather amusing. Usually they don't talk to you. But, oh, no, he said, I had nothing to do with the John. Absolutely not. So that's the end of that story. But to this day, to my knowledge, well, that was, was 1981 who he was killed, so that case is gone now, and it's a tragic story, a very tragic story. Mr. John, young Dijon, he was not. It was a tough story. He shouldn't have done I mean, he, he insisted on doing it, so he went ahead with it. And uh, he paid, I'm afraid, I have to admit, that he paid with his life. And I think that one of the reasons, but I can say, I th- I'm sure another television station or something else would have done the same. So that's water over the dam now, I guess. But you can't, he also was, was uh, singing away to the FBI. So I, I met, and I may feel a lot better. I think that was an issue, too. Although I think, frankly, the real problem was that he talked to the media that way. I think he almost had that death wish. He was irris with when he was spilling his beans. He knew enough that that type of thing was, was, could be tantamount to uh, his own murder, and it was. They would, that's one thing. They would definitely reciprocate with violence. There's no denying that. Chicago mob was probably the most feared group. And remember, it was a, it was a very, monolithic mob there's no crew the crew there's five crews but they all were under one leadership unlike new york we have all those families a lot of much mustache peach running around but uh, chicago was very well disciplined a man by the name of ken Edo, they called him tokyo joe he was the organized crime the outfits expert on what they call the bolita racket that was a game a numbers game played it by the puerto rican people in chicago and he was responsible for that among other things and he was arrested in a gambling raid and apparently the leadership of the mob some of the top leaders felt this guy cannot we can't risk it. He could spill the beans on us. And that was a guy who I think you mentioned was, he blamed with man named Vince Solano. So the story was told. What happened was that, uh, Canada was free on trial, free on bond, scheduled to go on trial. 
when one of his friends called him and said, hey, look, we, got, we want to get together with the Solano and these people and, and straighten this thing out, okay? Well, they'll meet you tonight at a certain location, these two fellows, a man by the name of Jasper Campisi and a man by the name of John Gattuso are to pick him up and take him, that is he, Canetto, to this restaurant where he's to meet this mob, uh, mob top mob guy to settle this issue to show that, hey, resolve this thing so I don't have to have any problems or to do my time. And, I was, and he would have done it. He was just what they call a stand-up guy. Well, they didn't believe that. So what happened, they drove into this parking lot, and Edo was pretty streetwise, wondering what the heck they were doing. He was sitting in the front seat, the guy behind him pumps something like seven bullets into his skull out of a twenty two, And uh, some of them hit, some of them did not. There was, uh, some of them had been jammed off. At any rate, the man had at least four or five bullets in his head, three or four bullets in his head. He feigned he was dead. And so they jumped out of that car and, moved, and ran into a, their own vehicle and fled the scene. Edo, meanwhile, gets up, bleeding badly from the head, and staggers across the street there was a drugstore. Goes in and tells the people at the pharmacy had been shot. Call nine one one. There was sort of a comedy at that when they called at first. <laughs> that apparently the dispatcher didn't know what it was talking about. Thought it was all baloney. But eventually, eventually the authorities came out of the scene. The fire department took him to a hospital, and they saved his life. And right away the uh, justice department people came right down there from the strike force and told Edo what had happened, and Edo by that time was no longer a stand-up guy. They tried to kill him, and that's when, of course, he, he identified the two people that, that shot him were responsible for shooting, a guy by the name of Jasper Campisi from Suburban River Forest, the other man by the name of John Gattuso, who happened to be a deputy sheriff of the Cook County Sheriff's Department. Campisi was an old-time mumster. Apparently he felt he could do what he wanted, because the federal authorities, Dan Webb at that time, I think was the strike, was the head of the Justice Department at that time in Chicago, the U.S. Attorney, they went, they picked him up talk to these guys. Do you realize, gentlemen, Mr. Campisi and Mr. Gattuso, what you've done, you botched this murder, you botched this assassination. The outfit is not going to let you live like that. You cannot do that. The smart thing for you to do is come forward, play ball with us, we'll put you in witness protection program, and you could live happily ever after. Campisi thought, no. I'm a friend of Ocardo. I've been a long-time pal of these guys. They're not going to do anything like that. So Campisi and Gattuso are free on bond and the next we know, these two bodies are found in a trunk of a car in suburban Naperville on a hot July night. This is 1983. The bodies of Campuzzi and uh, Gattuso were both found there, both dead. And they botched the job and they paid for it with their life. And by the way, there's another case that has not been solved. We don't know who the shooters were. And nobody was ever charged. No indictments. Nothing like that. So there's another mystery for you Hawkshaws out there. <laughs> the the Frank uh, Calabrese didn't didn't know who did that one. Or, uh, he probably they, know, but they never they never linked it they in their trial to who did it. No, they oh, never they did. As they said, that was settled out of court. As they said at the time. Yeah. And that's never so. There was never no that has never been never been cleared as, as long as it's been there, which is too bad. So I come to the high profile cases like the Dorfman case and others that uh, are Gene Kana, those have never been cleared officially as to who killed who and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of mysteries left with organized crime murders. Don't kid yourself. They really? haven't been solved. I think I don't think there's any electronic reporter that did, any, did more than, than, than I did on Spalatro. I figured I was the first guy that... I remember I was at a uh, gambling raid and one of the carpenters, this was the 19th, right when I first came with the station. I came with from BBM, I from uh, Lion D, 69, it was a raid. I was working late at night. We happened to be at 11th and State. And they said, hey, they got Tony Spilato in here. Now, I'd heard about him before, that he was an up-and-comer. And we went to get pictures of some tape with film. Not tape, with film in those days. I remember he covered up at that time. And that's when I started to have quite a uh, fascination of, uh, with him because he once vowed at that time they told me that uh, he was going to rule the Chicago mob someday. And uh, it appeared that he might. Uh, as it turned out, he moved up the ladder very quickly. He went out to look after Chicago mob's uh, interest in Las Vegas. And then, of course, it was killed in '86. And by the way, the, uh, the story uh, the, some I I, I I dispute myself as to why he was killed. The story was, of course, mostly the story was told. Uh, the one that supposedly what happened was that they they thought he's too risky. He was bringing too much heat on the authorities and the mob because of his activities at the jewel store in the, in in Las Vegas, and that also he had. Uh, not reported on some of his scores to share with the outfit people back in Chicago, that is, some of the jewel heists that he was responsible for there. I don't think that's true at all. I think what happened was, in my opinion, this was in 1986, that he went back to Chicago, this is in the spring of 86, and met apparently with Ricardo, or either, met with Ricardo either in Chicago or at his home in, in California, winter home in California, making a bid to take over because Ricardo was, was, um, was aging, and Ayupa had just been convicted, along with Jackie Cerrone and La Petra, and the leadership of the Chicago mob. In other words, the leadership had been blown away. And uh, uh, Spallone, that is, Palatra was making a bid for that, along with Joe Ferriola, 
was his only challenger, who was at that time sort of the chief enforcer of the in the Chicago mob and a very a very strong leader. And I think what happened, there was a power struggle. I think Ferriola ordered him killed. He was lured back to Chicago with his brother, and they were murdered. And I think that's what I think happened. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong and probably are, but I mean, that's that's one version that a lot of people don't think about, and I think that's what really why he was killed. In fact, I interviewed, I went out and did a, a special on, on, on Lefty Rosenthal before he even did anything on the networks of that, and uh, he, he he didn't want to talk much about it. One thing he wouldn't talk about was the attempt in his life at the, in, when he came out, it was at Tony Romo's, and the yeah. air was blown up. And he didn't want to say too much about his wife, but he, he, he had two kids, and he was training them to be great swimmers. And I remember he was very embittered about his wife not doing things to help him out. And that was the extent of that. But, of course, she she died of an overdose in, in the Los Angeles area when uh, they finally separated. But she was a wild one, I guess, and they had a lot of problems there. I'm sure of that. So let, the, hmm? let, let me get your opinion on one thing. Jane Ann Morrison of the uh, Las Vegas Review Journal recently published an article in which she had uh, sources, uh, FBI sources that, are now saying that Lefty Rosenthal was a top echelon informant during all this time. What, what do you think about that? It, it, it appears to me it's probably true because he he didn't even have to come and testify or uh, go before the grand jury. They didn't do anything to him during the skim trials. What do you think about that? You're right on that. That's a good point. He got, that was back in, you're right, at 86, and here he was alive and all at that time. You're right. No, he, he could have been. He, he, I, there's no question that his gambling acumen was very high. I mean, they thought very highly of him because he could generate a lot of money of him. And uh, that, uh, it's, of course, he was Jewish, you know. he's not. He wasn't part of the outfit in the sense that he can't ever be made. But uh, you're right. He may have had. It's hard to say what and the murder, why he was murdered there like that. It would not attempt on him. Whether it had something to do with Spilatro's, whether Spilatro wanted to do it, I think we'll never know. But that's an interesting point. I'm sure the guy out in Vegas, the writer there with the Paper Review Journal, they got some pretty good sources. I don't doubt that. So I would respect what he had to say about it. Ricardo that was in semi. He was in. He was in semi-retirement. He was still the emeritus. He was still, no question. He had major hits or anything like that. I would think it must have been a Cardo must have okayed it. I cannot believe that they would have killed the two the two brothers without a Cardo's okay. I can't believe it. I find that hard to believe. Uh, normally, yeah, when Ayupa would do it, but maybe Ayupa gave him. But Ayupa was in jail, but that didn't mean he couldn't make couldn't make decisions like that. Ayupa was, of course, at the Kansas City thing came down one in January, and the murder was in June. Right now, so did Joe Ferriola then ascend to the the head of the outfit? What's that, Gary? Did Ferriola then go ahead and ascend to the uh, no. the head of the outfit in Chicago? Harry Allen, no. Harry, I don't. Harry, by the way, was a nephew of Ferriola. By the way, he had some clout there with that guy. And I'm trying to think of that time where the hell what, what Harry was doing. <laughs> Harry was in and out of a lot of trouble at that point, and yeah, he he was still out. I think he was out. He had done some time in that armed robbery type thing at home invasion in Indiana. I think he was out by that time when that happened. But I don't think I don't think Harry had anything to do with the the, the murders of uh, of uh, Spalato brothers. I don't think so. I don't think Harry had. Anything no, to no, do with that. no. Fariola is being the person that ascended to take over the Chicago outfit. That's correct, and he was he was very thought very highly of of uh, by by Ocardo when I was told. And that he was the numero uno. And what happened to him, he, he could have, what happened to Ferriola was physical illness, nothing to do with his decisions with running the outfit. But he had, he came down with cancer. And then he was down at the Houston, at, at, at uh, the Bakey, I think it worked on him. I might be sure about that on the cancer. But then he had a heart condition and he died through natural causes. And that left a vacuum. And when he died, uh, there's, there's been a real power, real power vacuum ever since. And I think as far as any strong leadership are concerned. And I think, after that, too, that's when Chicago moved out of Las Vegas. I mean, they did, why they did that, I don't know. They definitely lost their influence out there. Why they did that, I don't know. But they retrenched after after the the two boys were killed. And uh, to this day, I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows why, but they did. And it became sort of an open city. Before that, I think most people felt that uh, uh, that Chicago really had the, the major voice in what was going on in, in Las Vegas. And that happened before him when they had a guy named Marshall Caifano on in the show as well, not just Spilatro. Well, and John Mazzelli before that. So they had their own people out there for some time. Speaking of, speaking of Las Vegas, uh, you were, let, let's go ahead and, and finish this off with, uh, your account of coming to Kansas City and attending the skim trials. So the, well, you, I'll tell you that, right. What happened was to the people that don't remember that is, of course, the real leadership. It was an, an, probably the biggest, I think, that in my lifetime, and these the bomb, biggest mob story of all. We had the leadership of the Chicago mob, Kansas City, 
Milwaukee and Cleveland all going on trial and taking money or skimming money from Las Vegas casinos. If convicted, the men that were mostly older were going to spend a great deal of time in prison, perhaps their life. And uh, I went down to cover it. Well, we went there every day for it, but we went for it to start. Roy Whitman and Roy Williams testified we were there also at that. And then, of course, later on, and then you had the final arguments and the jury out for some days. And so you got acquainted with these guys, batting the breeze. You talked to them like Sarone off camera. You could do that. But it was a fascinating trial. And I think I mentioned before that uh, Kansas City was smart enough. Dave Helfrey, I think, was the prosecutor on that, if I recall. You're right. And he, he, he realized as a hot property, I think, the Chicago Strike Force, the, the Justice Department in Chicago, did not think that was as good a deal. He took it and ran with it. And to my knowledge, it's been one of the biggest, biggest mob, mob trials you'll find because the results was it crippled, really crippled the Chicago organization, the outfit, really uh, staggered him with the top leadership going down. And that was true also in Milwaukee. Frank Balistrieri was pleading guilty. Kansas City was disseminated after that trial. And so there you had those three functions, three, three markets that really b- battered by what happened. And the top leadership of all those, of those families went down the drain one way or the other. They had either died or pled guilty and so on and so forth. And that, if we are down there, as I indicate that, I tell you one thing I remember, uh, the, uh, I enjoyed Kansas City, those great restaurants there, the Golden Ox and, uh, and the Herbert House. And I remember going to the Golden Ox, the only time I was there, lo and behold, who was there the night we were in there? Joey Ayupa and his entourage were there. <laughs> I remember that only too well. They knew a good thing. They knew a really good thing. And, I tell you, and one other story can I give that's not mob related, but we, they had a mini convent, Democratic convention there, I think in 70, whatever, one year it was down. The story was on the Golden Knox, a friend of my cameraman who was pretty streetwise, went down there to eat, and there's a big line waiting to get in, and he was in line like just everybody else, and he said that uh, Warren Beatty, and I know who was, who was with her, but no, I think it was... Uh, Part of this Hollywood entourage came in to see the major D to get immediate seating, of course, and they were told to go back to the end of the line. And remember, the cameraman said, that's the best thing that ever happened. Those guys need, they got to act like everybody else. And unfortunately, the Golden Ox is no more. But Kansas City was like a miniature Chicago in some way. You had a city that was a big railhead. You had a, a big meatpacking city there. You had an organized, strong organized crime town there. Great baseball town. I remember the Kansas City Blues. And the American Association would draw very well and so on and so forth. And, of course, you had a very good outfit there, too. And it was a great. It, was a, it reminded me a lot about Chicago, very much so. <laughs> By the way, speaking of Kansas City, I know that the mob, you mentioned Harry Alleman. There were stories at the time. If I remember, I knew people in Kansas City. There was an area right down the river they were trying to develop. The mob was. Am I correct? With yeah, the River Chris? Key. Yeah, oh, yeah. What they call that? The River Key. They had That's a big, right. big mob war over was there. Alleman went there, was down there, sent down there to keep some of those guys in order. And then there was, there was a couple of murders that they felt he was responsible for. Yeah, well, I, I have heard that. that was, I don't know. Yeah, that, I, was the, that was the street talk. Yeah, I heard that about one of them. Actually, I read it in, in some news article. And then I remember at the time, but I, I, I always doubted that story. And I mean, we had plenty of hitters here that. Without importing, yeah, I know that. Look at that. Sure. For example, in Chicago, one of the guys that was an outfit guy later was killed called Jimmy the Bomber Katura. Oh, yeah, I've heard of him. He was part of that chop shop. They had another guy called, they called him Pineapples. Because, <laughs> not because he liked the fruit for pineapples, but because he could throw them pineapples around. So, how would they have through that one? I don't know. So, oh, that was quite a ride, wasn't it? He's a great guy to talk to. He was a lot of fun. I hope you all appreciated him. He's getting really old now. I don't know. I think he's still alive. I would have noted if he was had, had died. I'll post some clips of this, some shorts of this. I'll keep them aside. And so when he does die, I'll do a little bit of a memorial on my YouTube page to uh, John Bulldog Drummond. He was quite a guy, or he is quite a guy. So don't forget, I like to ride motorcycles, so watch out for motorcycles when you're out there on the streets. If you have a problem with PTSD and you're in your former member of the service, go to the VA website and get that help hotline. And if you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, no matter what your background is, get hold of Anthony Ruggiano Jr. He has reformedgangsters.com. Go to YouTube and, and just search for Anthony Ruggiano Jr. You'll find his YouTube channel and he's got a hotline and, and he works in the treatment center business. So you can probably end up maybe working with him if you, if you go into recovery. So thanks a lot, guys and keep coming back. I appreciate all the support that you give me and all the comments you make. It's just been, it's a lot of fun for me is is the only thing I can say. It's just, it's my retirement fun. Thanks guys, 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 guys.